So the question is, how does evolution work? Well, if the following conditions are met, evolution, which is really just a change in the population over time, will occur. So if individuals within a species are not all identical, if offspring inherit, inherit characteristics from their parents, and if some individuals are either more or less likely to survive and to reproduce because of the particular characteristics they possess, then the population will change over time. So if we look at a diverse number of species and some individuals within them, we can see that they're not all identical. Within different groups of mammals that you can see in the left and in the middle, there are indeed variations within the species and with invertebrates as well. So with the starfish, you can see that they don't all have the same color, the same shape, and yet they're all members of the same species. Offspring indeed inherit characteristics from their parents. They inherit physical traits as well as some behavioral characteristics. And this is true of mammals as well as non-mammals. And some individuals are either more or less likely to survive and especially to reproduce because of the particular characteristics that, that they have. They have to be able to develop new behaviors. If the orangutan can't access termites using the tool, he or she is not going to survive and is not going to find any mates. Same thing with attractiveness, with ability to survive in a difficult environment, the ability to avoid predation, whether through armor or through camouflage, and the ability to exploit difficult resources. Slow cheetahs and short giraffes don't wind up doing very well. And all of this is about making sure that you have babies before you die. And indeed, these three conditions are almost always present. And if they are, and if some individuals within the population are geographically isolated and no longer able to reproduce with the rest of the population, the changes that they have in their subpopulation are going to be different from the changes in the rest of the population. And that's how divergence begins and how new species can form. So a long while ago, a species very similar to a modern day wolf gave rise to all of the different breeds of dogs. Each breed of dogs are still the same species, but given more both geographic isolation and reproductive isolation, as we keep essentially forcing breeding within just one breed of dog, they may diverge to the point that they're no longer the same species. And so how do we test this? It's fine to say that these are all logically consistent, but just like any scientific idea, we should be able to make a series of observations that are going to support the predictions that we've made. And so we're going to look at the next few slides at some of these predictions and how they hold up. Well, one of them is that despite an incomplete fossil record, there should be examples showing this slow and gradual change. And these forms are called transitional forms and thus transitional fossils. And of course, there are thousands, tens of thousands of known examples of fossils whose structures overlap with both younger and older fossils. So they're a transition from one form to the new form. Perhaps one of the most famous examples is Archaeopteryx or Archaeopteryx lithographica, which was described in 1863. And by 1880, there were almost a half a dozen specimens that had been found. And the thing with Archaeopteryx was that it was pretty clearly a transition between two things. It has extremely long digits with claws at the end on both the feet and on the hands. It has a long bony tail. It's difficult to see in these images, but it has teeth. And none of these features are very similar to birds. And yet, it has a beak. And most distinctively, it has feathers. Birds are, of course, the only species that we know of today that has feathers. And yet, very clearly, this animal, which was not a bird because of some other characteristics, has some very bird-like structures, the beak, the feathers, 
the curved pelvic bone, and from CT scans it was shown that the bones are hollow, which of course bird bones are today, and for the modern birds who fly, that's a tremendous asset because it decreases the amount of weight that they have to carry. So this is one of now several dozen different specimens that show this changeover from non-bird dinosaurs to bird-like dinosaurs to true birds. And another very famous example is that of the horses. Heracotherium was about the size of a collie, and modern equus is, well, you know, the size of a horse. And so how did this grow about 20% larger and about 100 times heavier in 50 million years? And of course, the answer is that it did it slowly and gradually. And so as we look at these, each of these skulls are to scale. So were this the actual size of a modern horse, this would represent Hyracotherium. And we can see that there were a large number of changes as the animals moved from having consisted of a browsing diet of living on leaves to a grazing diet and living in grasslands as grasses became more common and more spread across the world. So initially, not only were the horse ancestors extremely small, but they had a very different style of dentition. They had teeth much more different across the mouth than what we have in horses today. So they had more molar-like teeth in the back and canines and incisors, whereas today they have very uniform molars and premolars. Sometimes they have canines and sometimes they do not, and they have incisors. And that's it. And they have a very long and pronounced diastema, this space between the incisors and the premolars, which was not as pronounced or as long back in the original Heracotherium of 50 million years ago. Along with that, grasses are very difficult to chew. So animals that happen to have smaller, oh, sorry, larger jaws with a greater muscle attachment would be able to survive better. And so this trait was favored and was passed along successfully from generation to generation. And so over the millennia, you can see that the attachment for the jaw muscles became much larger and the lower jaw itself had a much bigger flange to support those muscles. Additionally, we can look at, again, these are all to scale, heracotheriums, leg bones and toes, and through equus, leg bones and toe. And you can see that as the transition went from living in forests to living in open grasslands, there were a series of changes. Now, they did not lose their toes because they didn't need them, but because it was not as necessary when living in a grassland, any mutation that caused a smaller size of these toes to occur could be passed along. It was not detrimental, and it may actually have helped, and so that gets passed along. And then another series of mutations makes that fourth toe disappear completely, and there was a reduced size of the two toes on the sides. It didn't hurt, so it gets passed along. It might even have helped, so it could have led to reproductive success. And over the generations, over the millennia, over millions of years, slowly and slowly, the side toes disappear until by two million years ago, and in modern horses, they only have the one toe. The same thing was found with whales. Modern whales don't have hind legs at all. Occasionally, they have a little remnant of the pelvic bone, but that's all. But if we go back about 30 million years to Bacillosaurus, we see that it had fully formed hip bones and leg bones and foot bones, but they were extremely reduced. They were what we might call vestigial. And if we go back even farther to about 45 to 50 million years ago, they had fully developed fully functional legs and were probably amphibious. And it's not just vertebrates. Invertebrates show this as well. We're looking at the top left here at Chesapecton Jeffersonius. This is our state fossil. And an older version of scallop called Chesapecton Middlesexensis. And you can probably see that if you look at the ridges on the shell, they are more numerous and more narrow in the Middlesexensis species and larger and 
lesser in number in the Jeffersonius, and these two scallops are never found together. These occur much later in time than these. There are also some changes in the shape of the hinge. So how does it go from one form to another form? And of course the answer is through a series of transitions including the Chesapectin middle sexensis pre-Jeffersonius variant, which is intermediary between the two. Another thing that we would expect is that if organisms share a common ancestor, they're going to share internal structures. And indeed, if we look at one of the most famous examples of the vertebrate forelimb, we see that whether it's a human forelimb using arms for grabbing, writing, throwing, a cat or an amphibian that's using it for walking or scratching, a bat, a pterosaur, a bird that used the wing, this forelimb for flying, or a whale that's using the flipper for swimming, they all have the same structure. And if we look at the image here, we can see that all of the upper bones are colored red. This is the humerus in each one. And they're all recognizable as having the same basic shape, this basic form. The blue are all the radii, the radius bone. The green are the ulna. The yellow are the wrist bones. And the purple are the hand bones and the fingers. And while each one is different, they have the same basic plan, one that Neil Shubin called the one bone, two bones, lots of bone. And the same basic body plan is present in all these various species because they all share a common ancestor. And so what I'd like you to do is take a few minutes and think about these. These are all found within the slides. And I'm going to end this video and start the next one. So after you answer these, start up the next video. Please present any questions that you have um, to me either in class or in an email or a Selly message.